Welcome to Invested in Climate. Protecting the planet and decarbonizing the global economy is the challenge of our time. Never before have so many people rallied around a common cause. We all have a role to play, and the opportunity we face is unprecedented. Invested in Climate aims to help people do more to address climate change through their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. I'm your host, Jason Rissman. I co-lead a climate venturing practice at the design firm Ideal, supporting early stage climate founders and organizations. I'm also an investor and startup advisor, and have realized that when it comes to climate action, I'll be a lifelong learner looking for the best ways to have a climate positive impact. If you like what you hear, give us a good rating on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you found us. Follow us on social, subscribe, and spread the word. Find episodes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. Thanks for joining. Spicy topic, Jason. Throw us under the bus here. No, it's good. It's good. There's a diplomatic way to answer this. Oh, it's super relevant and spicy right now. Hey, folks. I've been really curious about seaweed. I hear a lot about seaweed-based businesses, and there's a lot of hope and hype around the potential for seaweed as a climate solution. The seaweed market has grown to become a $15 billion industry, and it's projected to grow to $25 billion by 2028. So to learn more, I caught up with two aspiring seaweed startup founders, Alexia Akbe and Julia Marsh. Their companies couldn't be more different. One is using seaweed to eliminate plastic packaging, and the other is feeding seaweed to cows so, you guessed it, they burp less. This conversation helps highlight the range of possibilities for seaweed, what's so special about seaweed to begin with, some of the challenges seaweed startups are facing, and a spicy question that helped me understand one of the more radical seaweed ideas floating about these days. Okay, I promise no more puns, or maybe just a couple, but lots of insights to chew on. Enjoy. Julie and Alexia, welcome to Invested in Climate. So glad to have you both here today. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Excited to have this conversation. Where are you both? Where are you calling in from today? Calling in from the Bay Area in California. And I'm calling in from Kona, Hawaii, Hawaii Island. Lucky you, Alexia. What a beautiful place. Would love to come visit your headquarters eventually. I'm sure it's gorgeous. And I know that you were both in Climate Week in New York last week. Sorry we didn't run into each other, but uh, what great energy. Did you have fun bouncing around the city? Yeah, definitely. I used to live in New York, so it was a little bit of a renaissance for me in, in many different ways. And then to have Climate Week on top of that and meeting so many people face to face for the first time in a few years was wonderful. Renaissance. I love that. I also used to live in New York. So similarly, like all my best gal friends are still in the city. And it's a nice dimension to add. We, we both attended the regenerative travel event on different innovation happening around ocean and, and hospitality, which was really rewarding. Fantastic. I used to live in New York too, but I can't quite claim that last week was a renaissance, but it was it was great to be <laughs> re-immersed in community. So we have so much to talk about. Let's dive in. You both are entrepreneurs founding really innovative companies in the seaweed space. And I'd love to just get a first an understanding of what those companies are and really the problems that you're aiming to solve. Julio, let's start with you. Tell us about Sway and the problem you're addressing. At Sway, we are replacing very annoying plastics with seaweed. So we use the naturally abundant polymers found in different types of seaweed that are farmed all over the world to replace single-use plastics. And this is really focusing in on packaging, um, but ultimately we want to see seaweed making its way into all sorts of climate solutions. Amazing. Alexia, what about you? What is Symbrosia and the problem that you're trying to solve? Yeah, at Symbrosia, we grow, quote unquote, new species of algae in terms of commercially um, utilizing the species as a cattle feed additive to reduce their enteric methane emissions, which is the largest source of greenhouse gases affiliated with livestock. So when you think about all the press around beef and milk products, this is the reason why. And so with a sprinkle of the seaweed in the feed, you can reduce their methane emissions by over 80% we're finding in a commercial setting. So um, pretty major reduction in, in this source of emissions. 
So I have to dive in right away and ask a follow-up question just to better understand it, because I know that we're already using over a quarter of the world's land for livestock grazing. Is it really a good idea to start using the ocean too? And aren't we better off investing in ways to radically decrease the consumption of meat? Yes, I think that when I started on this journey, that was actually my mission. So I spent a lot of time in the kind of consumer education space and climate and food systems trying to convince people to eat less beef and dairy. And I quickly realized that um, it was really frustrating that four or five years ago, not as many people were willing to shift their diets as they are now. And, and thinking about the different planetary boundaries that we have and the time frames that we have to reduce our emissions, this seemed like a practical solution in trying to save, quote unquote, save the planet while we're also shifting our diets towards plant-based. So I've been vegetarian for five or six years of my life, fully support transition and reduction of, of meat intake. But at the same time, I'm looking for a solution or trying to push the solution forward. Okay. Thank you for that. So we have two fascinating and very different examples of businesses using seaweed to replace other materials and as a result, reduce emissions. And it's worth noting that these two examples are far from isolated. There's many, many others and a growing market of seaweed-based businesses. So it makes one wonder, what's so special about seaweed? And perhaps you both can share how you got started and why you're focused on seaweed. And maybe more broadly, why is it being looked at as a potential climate solution? Alexia, would you like to go first? I guess historically, seaweed has been a wonder, or algae in general, has been a wonder as an input, particularly around biofuels and gas replacement. So there have been many market pushes to find alternatives, um, usually geopolitical reasons to become less reliant on other geographic sources of petroleum. And so there had been a really big push for seaweed aquaculture and different microalgae production prior. The Unit economics of that solution to be feasible would have to basically surpass the possibilities of photosynthesis. This started in the 70s. There was another kind of shift of investment from the large energy companies in the early 2000s. Shell invested a billion dollars into 10 different projects. But what we found now, I guess, in this transition towards a bioeconomy or climate smart economy is that seaweed, while it might not be the solution for patrol, it could be a financially viable solution for a lot of other inputs like plastic replacements, other biologicals, fertilizer. So I think what we're handed with as the next generation of entrepreneurs is all of this research that really went a long way, but couldn't quite get there and a number of other problems that global corporates are being faced with. And so I think that's the intersection that we're at now and why it's so important. Yeah, I think with all this energy and attention going into nature-based solutions, we spend a lot of time looking at terrestrial crops or plants, but the ocean takes up the majority of the planet and it's full of these underwater forests and gardens that are totally unexplored. And seaweed's grown on this earth for over a billion years. It provides a huge portion of the oxygen we breathe. It provides habitat it provides food for life underwater and on land. And so I think the goal of any company getting into the seaweed space is just to extend that impact. The obsession with seaweed that you mostly see in the headlines is that farmed seaweed doesn't need fresh water because it grows in the ocean, doesn't need arable land, which is increasingly sparse. It can actually contribute to the health of our oceans. So improving biodiversity, which is a vital component of combating climate change, buffering ocean acidification, sequestering carbon, and then providing coastal employment to communities that have maybe been affected by overfishing. So the benefits are many, and then it's also just a really low input, efficient and abundant source material, which is what we want for any of the solutions that we're going to invest in. Great. And we heard a little bit of Alexia's history of, of being vegetarian and wanting to focus on reducing meat and eventually realizing that there's a path to reducing the impact of meat. Julia, what about for you? What was your founder journey? Yeah, I was a big, uh, as we consume meat, we also consume plastic. And I was a designer working in the packaging space with uh, consumer goods companies and technology companies and design studios. I was the person responsible for bringing plastic into the equation. So 
that just totally felt at odds with growing up in California next to the ocean and wanting to, you know, create positive impact and work of consequence and not just create beauty in the world as a designer. So that's what led me to start this investigation into new materials, maybe not partial fixes like what was readily available to me, but going a step beyond that and kind of embodying the concept of regenerative design, which a lot of folks are increasingly talking about thanks to the principles of the circular economy, but maybe struggle to enact in, in, uh, in truth. Definitely something that we've worked on a lot uh, at IDEO and excited to see the momentum, but also excited to see it go from principle discussion to working with real world solutions like you get to do every day and like, like we've gotten to do uh, working with partners like you and others. So just to provide more context before we go deeper into both of your companies, let's make the growing seaweed market more tangible for listeners. And you're both immersed in the space, so I'm sure that you have other friends and know a lot of great companies. And just help us understand some of the breadth of what's happening. So beyond your own companies, what do you see as some other exciting applications of seaweed? And what's the range of potential that you see if we were to really leverage seaweed's potential? Well, the most exciting category to me is probably alternative fibers because they're adjacent to plastics. And there's a lot of embedded plastics in the clothes that we wear that we don't think about. There's a company called AlgaeNet, and there's emerging other startups in this space who are trying to replace these frustrating plastic polymers that make their ways into our clothing uh, with seaweed. And then the other big space is food. So a huge amount of interest in replacing bacon or burgers with seaweed. Uh, there's a company called Atlantic Sea Farms that just launched this sea veggie burger. I've yet to try it. It's coming out soon. There's a company called Umaro, which is also based here in the Bay. They make seaweed-based replacements for bacon. Pretty cool, but lots of activity. Yeah. What else, Alexia? What am I missing? Yeah, I think the food consumption or food products is most underrated. For me, um, Rootless is, I think, a really interesting concept. So they do seaweed-based, like, multi daily multivitamins. And I think one of the really interesting things about feeding seaweed to cows is that we've realized that there are 90-plus macro-micronutrients in the seaweed, and we're seeing all these weird health benefits that we didn't anticipate initially and in reports from the farmers. So I think the idea of integrating seaweed into the diets of you know, quote unquote, Western cultures more could also really push forward a lot of the concepts and um, benefit co-benefits that Julia mentioned around coastal seaweed farmings and coastal communities and kind of increasing the those supply, the validity of those supply chains, because that has historically been a tough challenge for the seaweed industry is like, yes, we can produce all this kelp, but where does it go? And so if biofuels not possible or these other, you know, price or that's not possible um, as an input for cheaper goods, maybe we can con uh, convince more Americans to to eat seaweed and utilize it in the way that a number of countries in Asia have successfully done. Although a lot of people are already eating seaweed and they don't even know about it. Seaweed is used as a thickening agent on a lot of the ice cream that we eat or in some of the like donuts in our toothpaste like it makes its way secretly in and it's also used as like a bonding agent in some of these alternative fish foods so if you know like current foods or finless foods these alternative fish products that are enabling us to kind of move away from our dependencies on harmful fishing practices are also using seaweed pretty cool Julia, you've now rendered this episode inappropriate for my kids who will use it to argue that ice cream is healthy in just one more way. <laughs> but thanks for that. I, I did not know that. I'd love to dive into the specifics and learn more about both of your companies and really learn about what's the technological breakthrough that's setting you apart and how far along are you in your journey? So when we started growing a quote unquote new species of seaweed, we had all these funny projections about how we were just going to start increasing our production month over month and we were going to meet, you know, 10% of the market in the first year. And then we quickly ran into the realities of being essentially a farmer. And so when you think about the resources that a farmer has when they're working with a crop, they can buy seed. There are already kind of methods utilized to grow it in the field and and well-known processing methods, harvesting and distributing as well. And so when we started, we really had none of that. So what we've kind of landed on as our differentiator is Julia mentioned seaweeds are very old, um, like taxonomy-wise, been around a billion years. 
There are over 12,000 species of seaweed and we only grow five of them. So what we've done is brought another species into um, the realm of being able to cultivate it. So a lot of that has been hinged on a foundational seed bank. So we have over 500 different strains of the species that we've collected from four islands in Hawaii um, to really start understanding the functionality of the species and selecting specific strains that can go in this use case. Um, so I think that's the first step of trying to bring more of these seaweeds that might have really novel use cases into production so that we can continue to evolve um, the number of products we can make out of seaweed. So that's kind of our biggest differentiator. We have the largest seed bank in the world of the species and continue to kind of hybridize and evolve upon it. Great. In terms of market adoption, are you already distributing to partners and are you serving customers already? Yeah. So we're doing pilot programs now. Typically in agriculture, what happens is if there's a new product, you kind of have to demo it with the farmer. They have to see for themselves that it works before there's more widespread adoption. Regulatory wise, we can only really use this product right now in California. So we're also working on national regulatory approval, but um, we do have two pilots, one with a beef um, company and then one with a dairy company ongoing. Alexi, I've never asked you this, but is a farmer able to gauge whether a cow likes your seaweed? Oh yeah. So we've done palatability tests at universities too, where they just time like how long it takes the cows to eat the seaweed, if there's any seaweed left. Um, over time, we found that as our process has got more gotten more streamlined, that the product quality is better and the seaweed then ends up tasting better. So yeah, we have a video on our Instagram of like cows just like chowing down <laughs> on the seaweed. Um, it is really high in minerals, which often aren't found naturally in forage too. So um, it does provide them these minerals that they know they need. Julia, what about you? So at Sway, our big goal is to replace plastics at scale. We're specifically focused on thin film plastics like bags and wrappers and pouches, commonly found in food and in fashion and in personal care and cosmetics. The challenge or maybe the opportunity <laughs> to actually replace these plastics is to design material formulations that work with existing infrastructure. So the breakthrough technology, the focus of everything we do at Sway as a material innovation house is to work closely with those in the traditional plastic space to make bio-based formulations derived from seaweed that don't require new machinery, that can just be plugged into the system that already exists. Not trying to reinvent the wheel, just trying to bring new materials into the mainstream and make them accessible. I would say that's the big breakthrough. The other is that a lot of the materials that are readily available to most of us, besides plastic, are not actually better for the planet. And especially in applications where you've got a really limited span of time where you're using the packaging, maybe a span of 12 seconds, you know, carrying your groceries from the store to the car, and then it's just going in the trash, that's a great place for compostables to come in. The problem with a lot of compostables is that they don't actually decompose. So another breakthrough of our materials that's designed to home compost within a span of eight weeks, meaning you can mix them with your food scraps, you can mix them with your garden waste, and you can literally watch it decompose if you're skeptical. <laughs> you can watch it disappear in front of you and there's no microplastics. It's just nutrient rich seaweed material. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And Julia, what about you? How far along are you and what are your what are your plans for growing? Similar stage. We're launching pilots behind the scenes right now. We're doing a bunch of different tests with mostly folks in the fashion space. We were announced as finalists in the Tom Ford Plastic Innovation Prize earlier this year. So you can get a kind of sense of the types of partners that we're working with. And then the plan is launch publicly next year, scale up for commercial, and uh, hopefully people can really get their hands on this material and give us feedback on whether the story of seaweed resonates with them or not. Well, congratulations. I know that's not the first prize that you've won. <laughs> we were also uh, winners in, in the... Um, Beyond the Back Challenge, organized by IDEO and Closed Loop and a consortium of global brands, which was frankly game-changing for us because prior to winning that prize, we didn't have a huge amount of visibility. We had a prototype. We had a sense of our supply chain. We knew the types of partners we wanted to work with. But through that 
the experience of that year long program, we got real insight into how global brands actually work, how they actually source their packaging. Also got the visibility that enabled us to really like expand our team and raise money and get to where we are today. So truthfully, very thankful to, to Open Idea. And we actually continue to work with folks from that team. So it's a it's an ongoing relationship. Really excited by the progress for both of you. And, you know, it's a familiar story. During Climate Week, I was in a room full of entrepreneurs talking about the barriers to scale for the circular economy startups. Folks were talking about moving from pilot to expansion uh, and getting the types of partnerships and capital uh, and awareness and product market fit. And I'm curious for each of you how you're thinking about that transition and really what are the biggest barriers and what needs to change to accelerate your path to scale? I mean, the transition from pilot trial to recurring customer is definitely going to be a big transition for us and kind of a learning process. The number of different arrangements that we've already had with those sorts of trial partners has differed widely as we try to figure out the best vessel to take a customer through. And so um, we're transitioning in some ways from a purely R&D company to a production company to having a sales pipeline. And so just really understanding the nuances and like the hard and fast tangible ways to set up those programs is definitely, it feels like a sign of maturity in a startup that unless you've been through that as a part of another company, it's probably really difficult <laughs> to figure out how to navigate that process because a lot of times, you know, an investor, for example, maybe has never gone through that process, but might be one of your main like brain trusts or someone that has, is already working for um, a pretty large and well set up company may already have all these existing processes in place and hadn't had to like think through the, the different nodules at each point. So I think having the grit and like the persistence to continue to build those pipelines is yet another steep learning curve for us. And so I think that's, again, as an entrepreneur, you're just continuing to level up all of these different knowledge bases. And that's kind of where we are right now. So I think getting the right expertise and, and finding people that are willing to, to think about all of those details involved in setting up a new process like that. Honestly, it may be too soon for me to say what the challenges will be in commercialization because we're not there yet, but I can make guesses. One is probably more boring, which is just tied to legislation and policy around single-use plastics and how we define what a plastic is and what companies decide around continuing with recycling and wanting to continue working with plastics versus being open to adopting biomaterials that are designed for compost. So that's maybe like an emerging space that we'll continue to adapt to. Um, I think a lot of people have strong feelings about recycling. There's a lot of publications saying recycling doesn't work, but we believe that recycling can work in certain situations and so can composting. So that's kind of one challenge I think we'll continue to adapt around. And then the second is, and I don't know, Alexia, if you've had this experience, but there's so many shiny objects mm -hmm. in this space. There's so many problems to fix. The scale of the issue is so large that I anticipate it being very challenging to just focus on the one thing and just scaling the one thing. Um, I want to scale a bunch of things simultaneously. So I'm not really sure how we're going to manage that probably the, the more real challenges are just going to be supply chain delays and lag times and, you know, <laughs> the more mundane. But those are the, the two that really readily come to mind. Great. In a recent episode, I spoke with Tom Chi, the founding partner of At One Ventures, and he argued that there's three major drivers for businesses that are essentially about replacing uh, traditional inputs for agriculture or manufacturing. And, and those three drivers are the feedstock itself. So where's it coming from and, and the cost of getting it processing as in turning it into whatever you need it to become and transport logistics, getting it to where you need it. And he argued that all three of those need to add up to a more economical opportunity for your potential partners and that the, uh, that the environmental economics also needs to be better. 
as in your processing can't ultimately have a higher carbon footprint than just using the traditional materials or the logistics and transport. And so I'm curious, does that framework resonate for you? And what does it tell you about your own business and, and how you think you'll be faring as you grow along those three lines? All about the unit economics. <laughs> I'm familiar with this, this um, logic, and I think it generally does make sense. Obviously, if we want to compete with plastics, we have to at least get within the ballpark. However, I don't think today plastics are holistically valued for their true cost. And with a material like ours at Sway, and I would argue for Alexia as well, it's Ambrosia, there is so much baked in value for the environment and for society that it should be valued at a higher price potentially. Because when you adopt this material, you're getting contribution to biodiversity, you're getting carbon sequestration, you're getting ocean acidification buffering, <laughs> you're getting coastal livelihood, you're building resilience around coastal communities, you're creating healthy soil and that material is composted. There are all these other externalities that I don't know we have systems in place to kind of get a clear sense of return on investment, but this is like a more valuable material than what plastic can do. So should it cost the same as plastic? For it to scale and be competitive, yeah, but should it cost the same? Alexia? Yeah, I mean, the heart, we are in many ways a manufacturing company. And so all of these, the one, two, three at the, at the beginning is our lifeblood daily, right? It's just how are we even getting a product into the market? And so when I think about the unit economics, I mean, we do a lot of customer discovery and building up this value added product that not only involves the sourcing, the processing, and the logistics. It involves the story. It involves the consumer awareness. It involves all of these like front end things to make the product more viable to the farmer as well. And I think that's going to be one of the the major points to you know building off of Julia's comments about this being a premium product is convincing and building the story around that premium product for us. Yeah, I don't think that by now, I don't think we would still be here if we thought that sourcing, processing, and logistics was going to be like a, a major hurdle. And luckily, I think as women founders too, we're less likely to convey that that things are going to go well or really inf inflate the possibility of our solutions. I think that we're pretty grounded and rooted, and there's a lot of data to state that we make more conservative assumptions of of our capabilities in the startup world. So. I think we're both pretty sure that it's, it's feasible. Yeah, agree. Hard agree. Great. Love that you brought that point up. Thank you for elevating that. So for others that are thinking about seaweed businesses, either as an entrepreneur or an investor, what's something that they should consider? You both have sort of insider knowledge of the seaweed industry, and not all seaweed businesses are alike. What do you think is setting some seaweed companies apart from others? There is a huge amount of scientific research coming out right now that's helping to illuminate whether the claims around seaweed in terms of carbon sequestration or contribution to biodiversity, all these points I've been referencing, like to what extent they truly have an impact and how they those impacts can be amplified. So I would say what distinguishes these different seaweed companies is how much they listen to and amplify the science. It's all emergent and Anyone who says definitively seaweed definitely in all circumstances does this is probably exaggerating. So I would say that's one point to watch out for. Yeah. And maybe taking that one step further to like focusing on a specific use case or a specific part of the solution instead of trying to go broad with seaweed in general and claiming that your seaweed can do a million things, but really honing in on like one section of of that possibility and being really good at it instead of trying to do a million things. A model that I really like and that we've tried to partake in is collaborating with NGOs that are really close to the oceans and trying to better understand our innovation can benefit their work and how we can highlight or showcase the research that's already been done. Generally, NGOs are craving innovation to push 
their research forward. So if I were starting all over today, I would go and find like a really inspiring, inspiring ocean organization and just say, you know, how can I help? I'm an entrepreneur. Tell me what to do. <laughs> so as we mentioned at the beginning, you're not alone. There is a growing seaweed market. And I'm really curious that as the seaweed industry grows, what does a more crowded space mean for companies like yours? Is it creating more opportunity through more investment capital and just better informed partners? Or is it creating a lot of noise and competition and distraction? I guess one hope that I would have is normalizing seaweed investments. I think even though climate tech is really shiny and, and there's a lot of, you know, quote unquote, cash available, we're still like agriculture in some ways. And that can be really unfamiliar to some of the, the funds that are shifting into climate investment. And so I oftentimes, I've made a deck now that I just give to investors who are like, I just want to know about the seaweed space. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to give you this resource first that kind of gives you an overview of the different types of macroalgae, the different use cases historically, and like what you should look for in terms of messaging and mismessaging. So I think there's a lot of investor education that could still be done to try to open the space up a little bit more because we definitely need investment to, to try to scale these solutions. Great. I'm sure we will be able to find ways for anyone listening to this who wants to get access to that deck to be able to get in touch with you because I think that that's a great service and uh, would love for more folks to learn from you directly. As we think about increased investment in the seaweed space and innovation here, first, I think about where investment in the seaweed space is going. So I have some fun little data I can pull up, which was in 2021, the startup, big startup investments mostly went towards application development, like food or companies like ours. That was the major, vast majority, 36 investments. 28 went towards farming and harvesting, five towards processing, four towards equipment, one towards restoration. And this comes from phyconomy.net, which is an awesome resource. So huge amount of investment in applications and farming. That's great. But in order to make those applications, you need the equipment and the processing infrastructure. And that's the biggest bottleneck to Sway and companies like ours growing and certainly where I think more energy could be directed. The second piece is, as we mentioned before, thousands and thousands of species to choose from. Reds, greens, browns, different compounds inside, different potential in each of them. And we're just scratching the surface with what's there. So I think to not over extract from the ocean as we've done with terrestrial ag and to essentially embed regenerative practices from the beginning, we have to distribute attention across different types of seaweed, across different regions of sourcing. So we're not, yeah, just falling into these poor patterns of the past and then constantly engaging local communities and recirculating value there so that we're not just showing up and saying, <laughs> we need a ton of this material, sorry. Can you, can you make it for us? So it's about coalition building and, and you know engaging local stakeholders and not repeating the woes of the past. I'm curious then what you would say about the hype and the aspiration around seaweed for sequestration, because there's definitely a lot of talk about really carpeting the entire ocean floor or as much as possible with seaweed, uh, because then it could trap carbon. What do you both think? Spicy, spicy topic, Jason. Throw us under the bus here. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. There's a diplomatic way okay. to answer this. I'll let you <laughs> go for it. There's a lot of emerging science being done. There's recent work done by Oceans 2050 and the Institute for Abundant Oceans that just came out that says seaweed has the carbon sequestration potential of 421 teragrams, which I looked this up earlier, is a billion kilograms of CO2 annually, globally. Which is to say, seaweed already sequesters a ton of carbon all around the planet already. However, we don't know truly what happens when we sink it purposefully in a man-made way down to the bottom of the ocean floor. We don't know what effect that will have up and down the water column. We don't know what, uh, how, how uh, that will affect ecosystems. Just don't know. So that's why it's a, a point of tension. The other side would also say... Why are we sinking valuable material to the bottom of the ocean floor? We could use it for things like livestock feed or biomaterials. 
So why not use the material that we're cultivating rather than sending it down to a place where yeah, we, d we don't quite know definitively the impacts. I think like many other nature-based solutions, creating protocols that are um, scientifically backed and measurable to determine how much carbon is actually sinking is going to be a very difficult process. And we've seen this with soil carbon, with a lot of our customers that have been down that pathway and haven't received funding for changing their soil practices, even though they were told they would, um, measuring that sequestration is going to be extremely difficult, especially when we really don't know that much about the deep ocean. We know more about space than we know about the deep ocean at this point. So I think it's, it's a ways out from having a verified carbon credit protocol, but it's tempting and there have been many investments in this space. Thank you both for, sorry, pun unintended, but diving into that tough question. Let's turn now to what consumers should know. My kids think that they can eat as much ice cream as they want because you've told them that seaweed is in it. But what really should all consumers know and think about seaweed? And in fact, maybe uh, not all seaweed is actually healthy, is that it can, uh, can be full of heavy metals and too much seaweed might actually mean that you're ingesting an unhealthy amount of arsenic or mercury or lead. And I've read that uh, taking supplements um, is perhaps more risky because they're, at least in the US, not regulated by the FDA, whereas fresh seaweed actually is. Um, but you're the experts. Tell us, what is what should we as consumers know and, and think about seaweed? I always think about seaweed like an herb. It's really potent in all of the nutritional value that it has. And so it might not be the main staple <laughs> of your diet for that reason. Like you shouldn't probably eat a pound of rosemary. There could be detrimental effects. Um, I think it definitely depends on the species, but to your point, wild seaweed can accumulate a lot of heavy metals, but a lot of companies do have internal quality assurance to measure those levels and it should be available um, on the ingredient label on their website. So you can do your own kind of quality insurance on that. But I do believe that the health benefits largely outweigh any sort of safety risk if you are paying attention to things like heavy metals. This is entirely outside my realm of expertise, actually. But I might just add that whilst the consumption of seaweed may not feel common in the United States, it is. We love sushi. And a good portion of the world regularly eats sushi and eats seaweed soup and eats all sort of sorts of seaweed products. So presumably, I mean, I think the entire continent of Asia is pretty interrelated with seaweed cultivation and consumption, and they seem to be doing fine. <laughs> That's just, you know, not a scientific answer, but conjecture. Yeah. And uh, actually, I learned that about 20% of meals in Japan contain some type of seaweed. So um, it absolutely can be safe and a regular part of one's diet. Fun to know that you're not both just eating your uh, raw ingredients there and not living on seaweed, although using it for your livelihood. So you both brought up the possibility that seaweed-based businesses actually are contributing to communities in another way, uh, and that's by creating jobs. Tell us a bit about your vision for how your companies can be supportive of, of a broader ecosystem where more people are engaged in, in this industry. The uh, potential of seaweed and the expansion of the blue economy to sustain coastal communities is my favorite piece of the seaweed story. The World Bank projects there are 50 million indirect jobs and 50 million direct jobs related to the seaweed industry and food alone. And the quite cool thing about seaweed farming is that the majority of seaweed farmers globally are women or people of color. And so there's a social justice or a, a social impact component of the seaweed story that maybe is overlooked, but should be amplified. Some of my favorite seaweed farmers are based here in the States and they're women-led organizations where they're actively transitioning lobster fishermen who maybe need more sustainable employment towards kelp farming. There's a group called Atlantic Sea Farms again, who's built a model that enables lobster fishermen to farm year round. So in the wintertime, they plant their kelp 
and they harvest it in March. And then over the summer, they fish for lobster and they have year round income. And those are the types of models that we need to support as we adapt to the increased impacts of climate change. And I can speak quickly to my experience here in Hawaii and the blue economy and, and promoting aquaculture. So during the pandemic, Hawaii hit about a 40% unemployment rate because 40% of the population works in tourism. So 40% of the population here works in an extractive industry um, that does not benefit the, the local community. The community is here to serve tourists. And so when we think about the security and the future of Hawaii, um, you know, having that sort of dependence on tourism and imports is really scary for food security, for job security, for the livelihoods of the people that live here. And so creating any sort of local, better paying jobs that involve STEM or agriculture is a really big plus for the community and um, is creating any jobs involving STEM and agriculture is a really big plus for the community because you're giving back to that local community and those resources and that knowledge is staying here and providing increased opportunities and, and ways to move up and around an organization. So just having alternatives to tourism where we live is really important. Alexia, Julia, I learned so much and I'm really grateful for the time you spent with us today. Best of luck on your journeys. I can't wait to learn more about you as you grow and as you continue. And thanks again for being here today. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Invested in Climate. Please remember to rate us on Apple, Spotify, or Google. Find show notes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial, accounting, or legal advice. Thanks again.